Sup, how y'all live in my chooms and hair loss witchers? Hope you're all still fighting the good fight against the slaphead curse. Remember, a finasteride a day keeps the hair transplant doctor away. Of course, there is no shortage of finasteride related content on my channel as the drug safely and effectively stops hair loss in both the short and long term by blocking the 5-AR enzyme which converts testosterone into the trash hormone DHT which is the root cause of hair loss in people who have androgenic alopecia. 5-AR inhibitors are fantastic drugs not just for stopping hair loss but also for promoting overall health and longevity by reducing the risk of developing chronic diseases such as heart disease. Also, contrary to what a lot of people claim, finasteride is also a neuroprotective drug since DHT has long-term debilitating effects on the brain and I have made several videos which discuss all of this in depth which I'll link below. It really is remarkable, though, just how much of a trash hormone DHT really is. The only reason why anyone thinks it has any importance at all, in fact, past utero and early adolescent development is because of all the propaganda from DHT-simping bro-scientists who speak of DHT like it is the spice of Arrakis. Here's an example from professional DHT simp Hans Amato. DHT, the apex androgen for all men. Testosterone is only thought to be a precursor hormone in the body for the synthesis of DHT, which is the most potent alpha hormone. It's like cholesterol that's the precursor to pregnenolone and testosterone. Many of the beneficial effect of testosterone is actually through DHT, and blocking the conversion of testosterone to DHT eliminates those benefits. He who controls DHT controls the universe! This is, of course, complete nonsense, because even though DHT is a more powerful androgen than testosterone, its effects are paracrine, not endocrine, meaning the effects of the hormone work locally where the hormone is produced. There are only a few tissues that produce DHT, in fact, and these include the skin, the prostate, and the scalp, where it only does bad things like give us acne, enlarge our prostate, making it harder to piss, as well as, of course, causing hair loss. So... It is clear that 5-AR inhibitors are our best defense against hair loss and you should not fear them because of all the pro-DHT propaganda from the DHT cells who infest the online manosphere and try to bully men into believing that fighting hair loss means choosing between our hair and masculinity. These guys like to act tough by belittling people who choose to use finasteride, but the truth is they're the biggest pussies of them all since they don't have the balls to save their hair. The reality is this though. DHT in adulthood has no role that testosterone cannot do better, and DHT has no influence on our virility whatsoever. But these 5-AR inhibitors that block the trash hormone DHT, like finasteride and dutasteride, are not our only weapons in our arsenal against the Norwood Reaper. Besides 5-AR inhibitors, we also have anti-androgen drugs that work by bypassing the 5-AR pathway completely and instead directly block androgens on the scalp by binding with the androgen receptors that that the trash hormone DHT tries to attach to. So instead of decreasing DHT levels, androgen receptor blockers actually nullify the effects of DHT by not allowing DHT to activate the androgen receptors. So androgen receptor blockers can reduce the influence of DHT in the hair follicles and theoretically have similar outcomes to 5-AR inhibitors despite working through different mechanisms. Even though this mechanism does sound effective, to date, androgen blockers have not yet proven to be more effective than 5-AR inhibitors at stopping hair loss. So even though there are several androgen blockers on the market and gray market, there isn't enough data to conclude they are good enough to completely supplant finasteride as a primary anti-androgen. But it is likely they still will help at least a little bit, and they may be a good addition to anyone fighting hair loss who is still losing ground despite using a 5-air inhibitor as well as a growth stimulant like minoxidil. So I don't want to speculate as to how these topical anti androgens compete against finasteride or dutasteride because there isn't enough data. Rather, what I want to do, I want to see how they compare against each other so that you hair loss witchers can make a more informed decision as to which of these anti androgen anti slaphead weapons you want to add to your hair loss stack, whether it be right now or sometime in the near future when potentially some of these androgen blockers finally get FDA approval. And as you'll soon see, there is a lot of misinformation out there about how powerful these androgen receptor blockers really are. So today, 
I want to take an old classic in the hair loss community, RU5841, and compare it to the hot new flavor of the month, pyrolutamide. Now, there are other topical androgen antagonists on the market like Fluoridol, and I already have a video comparing that one to RU5841, which I'll link below. There's also another one called CB0301, also known as Class Goderone, also known as Brizula, which used to get a lot of hype in the hair loss community, and I also made a video about it a long time ago comparing it to finasteride, but as it turns Turns out, phase 3 trials of this drug have been delayed, and there are rumors that it loses its efficacy after 6 months. However, a lower concentration of clascoterone has been FDA approved for treatment of acne, and this drug is called Winlevy. So there's a handful of these androgen blockers on the market, but people seem to ask the most about RU5841 and pyrolutamide. So how do these drugs stack up to each other? Well. First, here's a quick background on RU5841. It was a topical anti-androgen originally discovered in France in the year 1994, but it first gained hype back in the early 2000s. It was going to be the holy grail of hair loss treatments, but then right before it was about to be FDA approved, it was suddenly abandoned for mysterious reasons, and we haven't heard anything about it since then. It is, however, widely available on the gray market, and people have mixed their own solutions for use in their research subjects, usually by combining 20 milligrams or more of powder into another topical hair loss treatment as a solvent, such as tamoxidine, minoxidil, or alpha tradiol. Although you can also offer a drug-free solvent like a K&B solution, which you can find at most chemical research websites. Of course, this shouldn't be seen as an official dosing recommendation because there is no official dosing recommendation. The treatment was abandoned before any clinical data could be acquired. RU5841 is strictly a use-at-your-own-risk research chemical. In a sense, pyrolutamide, also known as KX826, can be seen as the spiritual successor to RU5841, and like RU5841, pyrolutamide is also available on the gray market as we speak. Although, unlike RU5841, pyrolutamide Pyrolutamide has actually entered and even completed phase 2 clinical trials, and it is currently undergoing phase 3 clinical trials right now as we speak. So, not only does pyrolutamide have a very good chance of actually becoming FDA approved, the clinical data is also extremely promising, with some data showing that pyrolutamide is equal to or possibly even superior to dutasteride, and I've done several videos already on pyrolutamide, which I'll link below. So, if this all holds up, then pyrolutamide may very well be the first FDA-approved topical androgen blocker to be released to the public. But how does it compare to RU5841 and other androgen antagonists, you may wonder? Well, let's find out, Jones. So first... Let's take a look at how these androgen receptor blockers work. Most of them simply bind to the receptor and thus prevent testosterone, or DHT, from binding. This is called competitive binding. There's also another form of binding called non-competitive binding, where the drug doesn't actually block the DHT from binding, but rather just inactivates the androgen receptor by binding someplace else. It's not too important exactly how the drug binds, as long as it keeps the androgen receptor from being activated and destroying our hair follicles. So, how do you assess exactly how powerful an androgen receptor blocking drug really is? Well, if you mix the drug with the androgen receptor, you're going to have some of the drug combined with the androgen receptor and some of it floating free. The more affinity the drug has to the androgen receptor, the more drug will bind to the receptor and the less drug will be floating free. In order to compare the affinity of different drugs, scientists compute two numbers. One is called the half maximal inhibitory concentration, or IC50, and it's the amount of drug that blocks half the receptors. There's another number called KI, which is a measure of the amount of free drug present that isn't bound to the receptor. With both the IC50 and the KI, the lower the number, the higher the affinity of the drug is to the receptor. Now, if you look at the forums and on sites that sell drugs like RU5841, they will often talk about the IC50 of the drug and sometimes also the KI of the drug. People will look at the IC50 of one drug and claim that it shows it is better at binding to the androgen receptor than another drug with a different IC50. However, as you can see here, IC50 depends on the concentration of the enzyme in the drugs used in the experiments, while KI is independent of the experimental conditions. So if an experiment measures several IC50s, you can compare them. But if you compare IC50s from different experiments, it might be like comparing apples to oranges. However, KI measurements can be more directly compared between experiments because it is not dependent on the concentration of the enzyme tested. So 
If someone gives you a list of IC50 measurements, they might not mean anything at all. KI measurements are more reliable for comparing the strength of androgen blockers. So it's harder than you might think to compare these drugs. In addition, there's also a lot of misinformation out there about these drugs. For example, here is a Reddit post that claims that pyrolutamide has a greater affinity to the androgen receptor than DHT. This is ridiculous, but I think people think this because the Wikipedia page on pyrolutamide claims that, quote, pyrolutamide binds to the androgen receptor with a very high affinity with an IC50 of 0.28 nanomoles, reference drug picalutamide had an IC50 of 3.1 nanomoles, unquote. Now, an IC50 of 0.28 nanomoles is extremely low regardless of the experimental conditions because DHT itself has a IC50 of about 3 nanomoles. So even accounting for differences in experimental technique, this seems like it supports the idea that pyrolutamide binds more powerfully than DHT does. However, the reference given in the Wikipedia article is this patent filed by Kintor in Canada and the text of the patent is almost impossible to decipher, but if you look at this table in the patent, the b is in micromoles, not nanomoles, and each micromole is 1,000 nanomoles. So we have to adjust the pyrolutamide IC50 in the Wikipedia page to 0.28 micromoles, which is 280 nanomoles, and that is certainly not more powerful than DHT binding. In fact, pyrolutamide looks bad if 280 nanomoles was correct. However, this table in the patent isn't even looking at androgen receptor binding. What is being tested in the patent application is the the IC50 of the drug effect on the levels of prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, released by the prostate, which is not the same as the IC50 for the androgen receptor. So unfortunately, we don't have from Kintor an IC50 value against the androgen receptor, but we do have the KI value, which at 24 is a little lower than the value for RU5841, which is at 26. Remember, lower numbers are better. So as far as we can tell, pyrolutamide is in fact a stronger androgen block than RU5841 is, although not by very much. So I was able to construct a table comparing the topical androgen receptor blockers, and it turns out pyrolutamide is indeed the best of them all, as it wins by a slight amount over RU5841. I'll link all the references for how I constructed this table below. Class Goderone comes in third place, and unfortunately, Fluoridol doesn't have any numbers to compare because it's not soluble in water, and therefore it's not possible to determine the IC50 or KI. However, based on some studies comparing Fluoridol to calutamide, I suspect that fluoridol is comparable in binding affinity to the other drugs in the table. So those are the numbers. But do they really matter all that much? It's probably not that important, actually. You can always increase the effect of a drug by increasing the concentration or by increasing the dose of the drug. That's why when Levy in the form of clasgoterone being used to treat acne is only a 1% cream, while Brizula will be a 7.5% solution. What is much more important than the binding affinities of drugs is whether or not these drugs go systemically. After all, the reason why a lot of people apply antiandrogens topically rather than take them orally is to avoid side effects. Unlike 5AR blockers that only lower DHT, androgen receptor blockers block both the trash hormone DHT and the alpha chad hormone testosterone. So you definitely wouldn't want to take these drugs systemically because testosterone, unlike DHT, is not a trash hormone. So you don't want to touch oral antiandrogens unless you're interested in transitioning since the systemic side effects would be feminizing. There are a lot of other antiandrogens like bicalutamide and flutamide that are actually given orally to treat prostate cancer, but obviously they would not be practical practical for treating hair loss as they would be the equivalent of chemical castration. Spiritolactone, which has an IC50 of 77 nanomoles, is also an oral androgen blocker that is sometimes used for hair loss in women, but it would not be recommended for men due to its feminizing side effects. Spiritolactone, however, can be applied topically, although it is far too weak to be a primary treatment for hair loss, and at best it is an adjunct to a more traditional hair loss intervention stack like finasteride and minoxidil. The bottom line here, though, Chooms, is that the important the important thing is not going to be the binding affinity of these drugs, but rather how they function during phase 3 clinical trials. Pyrolutamide is the furthest along of all these treatments, and it looks the most promising, but there's still the possibility it will have systemic side effects, or possibly not even be a very effective treatment at all. We'll have to wait and see. As far as RU5841 goes, I don't recommend it, because it was abandoned, and this raises my suspicions that it may have had intolerable side effects in some people. At minimal, these type of drugs will stack well with 5 air blockers, even 
even if they don't take their place. Ultimately though, they probably don't have as much effect at decreasing DHT levels compared to a 5 error blocker. RU5841 is estimated to have just 5% of the affinity of DHT to the androgen receptor. So we aren't talking about completely shutting down the androgen receptor with any of these drugs, despite what Reddit may think. So even though I do think there is a place for androgen receptor blockers in a proper hair loss stack, I do not think the majority of people need to consider it. A 5 error inhibitor will be strong enough, and even if you are losing ground on finasteride, for instance, which isn't likely, you'd probably be better off just using a stronger 5 error inhibitor like dutasteride, which can be titrated all the way up to 2.5 milligrams per day, which will give you twice the amount of scalp DHT suppression compared to just one milligram of oral finasteride. You could also add a growth stimulant like minoxidil or stamoxidine, but ultimately, for fighting hair loss, a 5 error blocker is still king. So, what about a topical treatment that is superior to 5AR inhibitors? Well, it could be that we may have to wait for something like GT20029 to really annihilate the antireceptors and the hair follicles because it works in a different way than pyrolutamide or any other androgen receptor blocker. What it is, it is an androgen receptor annihilator, and I made a video about it that I'll link below. So, We'll see if things change as we get our hands on more data in the future, but in the meantime, we should remain cautiously optimistic as these drugs get closer and closer to becoming officially available to consumers. Don't get me wrong, I am still very much excited about pyrolutamide, and if I felt it necessary, I would much rather use pyrolutamide than RU5841, but I still think it is going to be GT20029 that is going to be the holy grail of hair loss treatments. We'll have to wait a bit longer for GT20029, but at the very least, Pyrolutamide, along with the existing FDA-approved pharmaceuticals for hair loss, will help tide us over until it is finally released, hopefully within a few years. And with that, I'm going to enjoy one of my favorite side effects of finasteride, being able to watch Avatar the way of water without having to take a piss. See you all next time. God bless.